Now our next witness wishes to be known as Sue. Yes, sir. Sue, Sue please. please. Susan Elizabeth Threckle. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So you're here to talk about your husband Bob. And can we have up on screen, please, Paul, a photo of Bob with your son, David? Thank you. And we're going to keep that photo on screen, apart from when we have other documents or other material displayed. Um, and that was a photo taken in 1985? Uh, about 1985, yeah, on, on our holiday in Abu Dhabi. Now, Bob was born in 1943. Yes. And diagnosed with severe haemophilia A. How did, uh, was he treated during his childhood and young adulthood and how did his haemophilia affect him? Um, I think it needs to be remembered that Bob was actually 10 years older than me. So he was, had he survived, he would be one of the oldest surviving haemophiliacs. He would be nearly 80. And when he was a child, um, things were very, very different. There was no treatment, basically, other than bed rest, hot and cold compresses. Um, they tried things like snake venom. I think some of the old, older men remember that. Um, you know, goodness knows what that was supposed to do, but they tried it, it didn't work. Um, so, as I said, it was mainly bed rest, and he spent, apparently, according to his mum, who was a, a really great friend, she was lovely, um, many, many days and nights just lying in bed. And, and so she, she like most haemophilia mums, was a fabulous advocate, really strong, and... She would sit with him night after night when he was in pain and bleeding and no treatment. And Bob, as an adult, became a very, very good chess player. He was an act actually a chess champion for the DHSS. <laughs> and the reason for that is that she sat up night after night teaching him how to play chess. Um, and he also made, apparently, a little hole in the wall by the side of his bed where his imaginary friend, the mouse, lived. And when his dad would redecorate the room, apparently he had to paper around the hole. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was an unusual childhood. As far as education went, um, he was denied an education initially. They, they just couldn't find a school to have him. The mainstream schools wouldn't look at him. So, again, his mum went into battle and got him into Wilson Stewart Special School in Birmingham, which was and remains one of the finest special schools in Birmingham. It's fantastic. And there he became head boy and head of the scout troop because, as he said to me afterwards, he was the only one there really capable of doing it because <laughs> he was basically a normal little boy but with haemophilia. And his haemophilia didn't stop him being very active, very busy and leading a very normal, full life? No, not at all. I mean, he came out from Wilson Stewart with no qualifications because they didn't actually take them at that school. And he took himself off to night school, got whatever he needed to um, get into the civil service and made a, a pretty good career out of that. Uh, he got married, had two boys, had his own home, um, to all intents and purposes leading a normal life. I mean, when I met him, we used to do things like play badminton, believe it or not. And to see a haemophiliac playing badminton is quite an interesting spectacle. But then I'm rubbish at badminton, so <laughs> I, I would run up and down in front of the net frantically trying to find the shuttlecock, and he would do this kind of giraffe walk at the back <laughs> and, you know, manage to actually hit them because he got much better coordination. But he, as I said, he played badminton. You know, we, we had active holidays. And... It was when he was about 21 that he started to receive cryoprecipitate. Yeah. And uh, you've said in your statement that that transformed the treatment of his haemophilia for a number of years. I think it did for all haemophilia, actually, yeah, because until then there the basically wasn't any treatment. Yeah, it was time-consuming and they had to go into a hospital to have it administered. Um, but it worked most of the time. 
and yeah, they got used to it. It was fine. And if we have up on screen, please, um, Paul, 1564003. This is a chronology you've put together from Bob's mm. records. And we can see from this uh, 1968 um, being given fresh frozen plasma uh, and uh, cryoprecipitate, uh, and then 1977 being given cryoprecipitate uh, in April of uh, 1977. November 1977 notes that he doesn't have many severe bleeds, misses little time off work. And then we come to October 1977, 23rd of October, when he was admitted to hospital with a bleed in his thigh. And this, as you understand it, was when he was first given mm. not cryoprecipitate, but factor eight products. Yeah, and this was probably around about the time I first met him. I met him in the late 70s, so I think he just started on it when we met. And he was... Uh, treated at the Haemophilia Centre at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital mm. in Birmingham throughout this period. He was under the care of Dr Ian Franklin and Dr Frank Hill. Yeah, mainly Dr Franklin, but yeah. Now, his medical records show that following that first administration of Factor Eight in October of 1977, he received Factor Eight in January of 1978 and November of 1979. Can we just have up on screen, please, Paul, 1564002... We can then see, and this is an extract again from um, Bob's medical records, that box there shows in 1980 and 1981, Bob receiving factor eight BPL on three occasions and factor it on a, on a fourth occasion. And then if we can have up, please, Paul, 1564011. We could turn that round. These are from the UK HCDO database records. And if we look from the bottom of the page, please, Paul, up, we can see 1977 onwards. And if we look to the right-hand column, we can see that Bob received a range of different products, sometimes the BPL NHS Factor 8, but he received a range of different commercial Factor 8 products. Can I just make an observation about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I have applied to the UK HCDO for their records probably two, three times, I don't know, phoned them up, and all I've been provided with is a sheet of about, <coughs> you know, that long, four or five treatments for the, his entire life. And it is so wrong that we, as the victims, cannot get cooperation from these official bodies and have to rely on solicitors and legal people to do it. You know, I'm, I'm so impressed that you've got that because... I'd battled for ages and couldn't get anything. And if we just look at one further document, which is 1564012, we can see there, this is a letter that was sent by the West Midlands Regional Health Authority to Bob in May 1990. And we can again see a number of treatments listed there which show us um, the range of different products. Now, they don't entirely tally, as I understand it, the two documents we've seen, the UK HCGO and this. No. I, they're not entirely uh, compatible. And, and I'm not entirely surprised, but... But what they do show is that Bob received both NHS and commercial products over the period from 1977 mm. onwards. Now, you and Bob married in 1981, but yeah. you've known each other as friends and work colleagues since about 1977. Yes. Was Bob, as far as you know, given any advice or warnings or information about risks, any risks associated with the Factor 8 products? Well, obviously I wasn't there at the time, but based on conversations with, with Bob over a long period of time afterwards, no, none at all, um, he didn't want to transfer to it. He got a, nat a sort of natural suspicion about it. He used to... I, I could never understand, in my naivety then, why he was reluctant to treat a bleed. And apart from the fact that he could never find a vein, he just didn't want to use the product. And I said, well, for goodness sake, if it stops bleeding, why not just use it? And he said, because you don't know what's in it. Was he ever, as far as you know, given any advice or information or any choice about the different Factor 8 products? No. Now, in 1981, um, or approximately 1981, correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, and was infected with hepatitis B. Yeah, it was before we got married, definitely. I, I, I noticed yesterday that the dates in his hospital records are actually wrong because they refer to it at one stage. Um, 
Yeah, he got. He said he got hepatitis B. He was very jaundiced, um, really quite unwell. Um, and I, I remember the only advice we were given was dietary. And I, the reason I remember that is because, um, I mean, my culinary skills are not actually legendary, but I did learn to make this vegetable pie because apparently he couldn't eat meat. But, and I remember at the time that I was still living at home with my mum and, and we, we ate it round there. So that, that's why I know it was before we got married. And what was he told, if anything, about the hepatitis B and how was he told about it? transitory um you know it'll go away in time won't do you any harm you know just get on and get better and live your life basically and, and it was information that was given to him on his own at a regular clinic mm. appointment um, what was the effect of the hepatitis b did it pass it did but retrospectively i mean you can look back i mean hindsight's a great thing but i think the damage to his liver began then um as I said, he was clearly very unwell while it was active. But then, you know, we, based on the information we were given, we just kind of forgot about it and got on. Now, your witness statement explains that Bob tested for positive for HIV, HTLV3, as, as the records then referred to it, in 1985, but wasn't told about it until the summer and was told alone at a regular clinic appointment. Mm. We'll look at the records at the moment, but what can you recall about how he learnt and how you learnt? I recall that we were waiting to hear what the result was and that that day he was going into the clinic to get it. I, I was working, I, I was working as a teacher at a local school at the time, and I, I recall that he came round at lunchtime to see me. For some, I don't know whether we went out or whether we just sat in the car, but I do remember sitting on the driver's side, so he, we might have popped out or he might just have gone over into my car, I don't know. And he said, well, it was positive. And I said, well, you know, what, what else did they say? What advice did they give? And he said, well, they said, I've got to use um, protection when we have sex and tell Sue not to get pregnant for a couple of years. And that was it. Any advice about prognosis? No. He was told at one stage that... Um, you might be fortunate, um, the haemophiliacs might be fortunate because you may actually have been inoculated against it. And any advice about the practicalities other than in relation to sexual relationship, any advice about the practicalities of managing the no, risk of not infection? No, not think the press did a better job of that, actually, because they were always saying, well, you know, do you share toothbrushes? No, why would anyone share a toothbrush, you know, regardless of HIV? But... Other people seem more conscious of it being passed on, I think partly due to the uh, government advertising campaign, which was catastrophic for haemophiliacs. And we'll just look at a handful of records mm. to, to look at the dates um, uh, of, of tests and, and appointments, Sue. Paul, can we have up on screen, please, 1564008. Um, So we can see here, top of the page, 23rd of January 1985. It's a reference to Bob attending. Had venue puncture for HBV and HTLV3. So blood taken mm -hmm. for testing in January of 1985. Uh, and then if we look at, please, 1564014. If we look here at the first half of the page, again, we can see the date of the blood specimen, 23rd of January 1985. It's the examination, the purpose of it is HTLV3 and hepatitis screen. We've got a date stamp of the 25th of January 1985, but only a result there in relation to the hepatitis B. Nothing on this document in relation to the uh, uh, HTLV3. But if we then look at 15640.15, we can see here PHLS, Public Health Laboratory Service, Virus Reference Laboratory, request for HTLV3 investigation. Again, the date, 23rd of January 1985, there faintly. And if we go down to the bottom of the page, please, Paul, we see the result there positive. Now, it's, we, there's no date of the actual result. The first test result we can see in Bob's records is 1564016. 
And we can see the bottom of the page, positive for antibody to HTLV 3, 4th of March 1985. So whether or not there was a delay between January and March, by the beginning of March, there's a result yeah. in the medical records. As far as you can recall, Bob wasn't told until the July of no, 1985. definitely not. And we can see that... Um, we, we can see, actually, if we put, first of all, 1564010, please, up on screen. So it should be... Is there a second page to that? Thank you. We can see there there's an entry for the 6th of April 1985. So this is after um, the test result that we've just looked at. There's no reference there to the diagnosis being communicated to Bob. And then, if we go to 1564021, so we, we can see at the bottom of the page, in fact, it says check HTLV3 antibody. Uh, and then if we go to the 1564021, please, Paul. And this is not a terribly easy copy to read, but it's a letter 5th of July 1985. It's sent by Dr. Hill to Dr. O'Brien... Who GP. wasn't actually Bob's doctor. He hadn't actually been Bob's doctor since before we got married. So I assume our GP never saw this. So it was sent to the Bob's former GP. Mm. Um, but it says this, this man has severe haemophilia and has been trained to administer his factor eight concentrate at home. But like 60% of our haemophiliac patients who've been treated with American factor eight concentrate has developed antibodies to the HGLV3 virus. We're still unsure what significance to place on these results other than that he's been exposed to the virus. Uh, and then if we just go further down the page, it says this, I have therefore advised him to wear a sheath during intercourse um, and the virus can be... Um, Contracted. Contracted, thank you, sir, through sexual uh, intercourse. I've also advised him and his wife not to have another child in the near future. Um, so that would suggest your recollection of July 1985 is borne out by this record. Mm. This is when Bob was told. Yeah. And you don't know what, if any, is the reason for the delay between the test, the blood sample being taken in January and I Bob being told. Absolutely no idea, but, I mean, it seems to have been a very common practice at the time. Uh, and then we can see 1564010, please. We can go to the next page. This is the, the top entry, is the 25th of July 1985. It says, seen with wife to discuss AIDS. Uh, current situation is the wish to have further children. Um, and then there's a reference to, to you being tested and to be seen by me when result known. Can you recall anything about that subsequent consultation and, and you going along to be tested? I, I recall being tested, yeah. Um, I do recall writing to Dr Franklin after Bob had had his um, positive result, you know, basically saying we needed more information. But then I think this was the point when I started off into campaign mode, really, because as well as writing to Dr Franklin, I wrote to all sorts of people, including you know, the National Federation of Haemophilia and the Haemophilia Society and, you know, Birmingham Evening Mail and Lord knows who else. Um, and I would imagine that that meeting was just a response to me saying we need to know more. And we can take that down, thanks, Paul, and put the photograph back up. Thank you. Now, in 1985, when you received this news, you'd been married for just four years mm. and you had a two-year-old son. Mm -hmm. What was the impact of the diagnosis on, on your lives together at that point? Um, it, it put tremendous strain on our relationship. It, it changed, I think, people's perception of us. We, we were very fortunate in that we got a, a close-knit circle of friends and, and a good social life that revolved around friends, you know, um, and good jobs. And the people that we interacted with on a daily basis <coughs> appeared to accept it, appeared to be supportive. But you see, you, know, you never know what's going on quietly in the background. I mean, 
it was interesting to hear the lady earlier on say about her son not being invited to many birthday parties. David wasn't. He was a very, very quiet child, but still at the back of your mind, you think, is that because we were the AIDS family and that's how we were known? And suddenly, as I said earlier on, all these adverts on the television, you know, the crushing tombstones and all the rest of it, whenever they came on, you would be thinking, well, that's us. But it didn't feel like us because we didn't feel any different, you know. Um, and people started dying, you know, rock huts, and we were talking about earlier on various other people. And it became more and more real and more and more scary. You know, people were told, don't die of ignorance. A letter to Birmingham Evening Mail suggested that everyone with HIV should be instantly rounded up and put on an island somewhere off the coast of Scotland, I think was the preferred venue. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we were suddenly dealing with all this. Um, I told my amazing boss at work, he was one of the best people I've ever worked for, he was fabulous, um, but even he said, Sue, be careful who you tell. And I thought, no, we've done nothing wrong. I, you know, I'm not going to be careful who I tell. If people don't like it and can't deal with it, that is their problem. Um, and I'm glad we took that approach, but... Yeah, it, it changed us as a family. It changed the interaction between us, between, obviously, him and his mum, because she was worried to death, you know, his sister. Everyone was very protective of Bob. Um, and there was this non-information. There was this void of information, you know, people just floundering around, not helped by the fact that haemophiliacs, generally, I know Bob certainly, and I know a lot of others, were, were stuck in, in a haematology unit when specialist age units was, were springing up around the country. So they never had that specialism that was developing. They just had haematologists who were learning as they went along, basically. And you've described in your witness statement the impact in particular on Bob of his whole life becoming defined by the infection. Mm. Uh, and his plans and dreams crashing down around him. Yeah, I mean, Bob's first marriage had fallen apart, I think, through no fault of his own. He gained um, full custody of his two boys, which was unusual in those days, had to give up his own home and then move in with his mum, who helped bring the boys up. Um, and then when he met me, it was kind of a new start. You know, we had a... We bought this beautiful old Victorian house... Um, Strictly speaking, actually, he bought it, if I'm being completely honest. Um, you know, lovely garden. We had nice holidays. We both got good jobs. Then David came along to complete the picture. The boys always live with us, you know, the stepsons from day one. Um, so he got this kind of second chance, and then the whole thing was ripped away. You know, the rug was pulled from under him. You, prior to the diagnosis, you'd been wanting to try for a second mm. child... Um, but Bob was desperate not to infect you. He was, and and he is quoted as saying that I was desperate for a second child, but obviously he'd already got three, so there wasn't the same yearning for another baby, really. Um, I wanted one so that David had got a sibling closer to his own age, because obviously the, the other two were, were, were quite a bit older. <coughs> and... I must admit, I got a bit like a dog with a bone, you know, because I'm not very good when people say, well, you can't do that. <laughs> Stop it. Um, and so I kind of pursued that, and tried, we, we investigated everything. I remember um, Paul Hooper, who you, you'll have heard from or you will hear from, Paul and I were... Um, independently of other, each other, I have to say, investigating sperm washing techniques. Um, that was just in its infancy, you know, but we did a lot of research into that. And um, I wrote to the Oxford Haemophilia Centre to, you know, to see what they knew, knowing that they were the, the reference centre, the biggest centre in the area. And we, we were eventually offered um, an appointment down there. Um, do you want to hear about that now? Or? Yes, absolutely. Oh, well... We, we saw um, Dr Ritzer at Oxford and he, he gave different advice, in my opinion, to everybody else. He was kind of saying, well, if, you know, if you want to go for it, yeah, there's a risk. But... And then he went on to say that people don't like discussing their sex lives and there's obviously, there's clearly a bigger risk with anal sex 
And people don't like to tell you if they've been indulging in anal sex. And he was basically saying that the heterosexual transmissions were probably through anal sex. So as long as you don't do that, you should be OK. That didn't go down very well with the Queen Elizabeth. And were you getting different advice yeah, from the Queen Elizabeth totally Hospital? totally different, yes. It was basically don't. Bob's physical health started to deteriorate. What can you tell us about that? He wasn't too bad until he was put on AZT, and after that it was just catastrophic. It was, it was like slipping off the side of a mountain. Um, he got multiple infections. They were constant. You know, it was um, tonsillitis, or it was um, a, a urinary tract infection, or um, he'd have a chest infection, or something would be wrong somewhere. He was never free of infection. He lost a tremendous amount of weight. He started looking like an AIDS victim, but that didn't happen until AZT was started. But then the huge doses they were giving people in, in those days, he was on uh, 1,200 milligrams a day in two divided doses, you know, which I said at the archery inquiry is enough to kill a horse, and I think it probably is. And he started to have night sweats, fevers, bouts of diarrhoea. He always felt cold and he had difficulty yeah, swallowing. He, he did. Um, he had oral thrush, which was more than likely straight down his esophagus, yeah, and he was having problems swallowing. Um, and, yes, I've just got this vision of this man, cold, all the time. We've got a picture of Bob at the beach on his very last holiday in August 1990, yeah. which will show... Paul, it's 1564018, please. And we can see how much weight mm. Bob had lost. When he saw that photograph, I should probably get struck down by something in a minute, because when he saw that, he was horrified. He shouldn't have taken it. You know, he, he was appalled himself. Um, and the background to this is that, yes, it was our last holiday. It was in Pembrokeshire, and we'd... Um, booked a holiday cottage which turned out to be completely unsuitable for various reasons that I won't go into. David had his seventh birthday during that holiday. I contracted um, Campylobacter food poisoning which is like norovirus times two. Uh, I was just so ill. If I look back, and this is not me being dramatic I promise, I should have been in hospital on a drip. <coughs> You know, I got uncontrollable vomiting and diarrhoea. Bob ended up with a bleed. We both ended up at the local GP, and then the public health department came down to check me over when they found out what was wrong. And Bob's attitude was just, you know, you've just been so difficult, and look at the mess you're making, you know, and this wasn't the man I married. And it, it was like, well, why can't you drive? Why can't you do it? You know, you know it's so hard. That beach is actually Pendine Sands. Um, in Pembrokeshire, it's the one where they do the world speed records, and in those days, um, you could actually park on the beach, and that's why we were there because he could barely walk. I could barely walk. I mean, I, I, I was just about upright again, um, and that was his one venture out of the car. Paul, we can take that down and put back the photo of Bob and David. Thank you. Y you described Bob to the Archer Inquiry in these terms, Sue. You said. He was just an ordinary man living an ordinary life. He was a great dad, partner, brilliant friend. He was good fun. He was practical, dependable, reliable, and as honest and honourable as it was possible to be. Yeah, I stand by all that. I would also add that he was very old-fashioned, I suppose because of his age and his upbringing, and he would refer to me as my good wife. Or he'd say, he'd write in letters, your good self. You know, it was very archaic, but very sweet, you know. What was the effect on Bob emotionally, psychologically, of his increasing ill health? He just changed. His personality changed. Um, I remember one day when, it was probably a few, couple of months before he died, I had been to get my hair done, mainly to get out of the house, I've got to be honest, and I came back in, and David, as I said, was seven. We had a long sort of living room joined onto the kitchen. You know, that all been sort of walls had been knocked down and things. And David, he wasn't running, but he came down from the kitchen to the television at the other end of the living room, as a seven-year-old would. And Bob said, will you just stop him running around? 
you know, and it was, I remember thinking, this is so unfair on me, on David, he was doing nothing wrong at all, but he just couldn't cope. I can't remember what he was like with the two older boys, but I think they generally kind of kept out of the way. And in fact, um, Paul had left home anyway by that stage. So, And you've described in your statement Bob becoming very, very frightened. He was, excuse me, he was frightened, yeah. Um, he was terrified um, particularly of PCP pneumonia, which he knew he was susceptible to. And the slightest cough or sneeze you could see the terror just etched on his face and again this is like confession time but um one night he'd been going on all day saying i think i might have pcp sure it's not pneumonia and he basically got just a little bit of a tickle you know and he he this sounds awful he wasn't actually ill that day and in the end i just couldn't stand it anymore and i just walked out and went up to my friends up the road and just spent an hour up there and crept back with my tail between my legs later on. But it, it, you get to the stage where it doesn't matter how much you love and care for someone, you can only put up with so much criticism and so much negativity, you know. And it got to the stage where he didn't want you to go out or go anywhere. He no. wanted you to be there with him. I was talking to the milkman one day. We'd had the same milkman for years. And we were just... And it's probably, you know rubbish weather, you know, you think it'll snow and I'll have a couple of pints of semi-skimmed or whatever. And I went back into the living room and Bob said, what were you talking about? It's a milkman, you know. And then on another occasion, I booked to go on an art course at the local library. It only lasted a couple of hours. It was just a one-off. And I remember we, had to, we were given pastels and we had to recreate this, I think it's a Renaissance-type picture, that one with the women in the bar, you know. And I was really pleased with what I'd done. The, the tutors were excellent. And I absolutely loved every minute of it. And it, it was just a break for me. I went outside and Bob was standing there with David. Do you know how long you've been? What have you been doing? You know, and it just makes you feel... Well, what else can I do? I try and get everything right for everybody. I try and, you know, keep all the balls and... Is it balls or plates in the air? I don't know. Um, but either way, there weren't any in the air because they just get crashing down around me, you know. And Bob was also very angry. Mm. And he was angry in particular, your statement says, because he had not been given the opportunity to make his own informed choice no. about the treatment he'd received. But, you see, there wasn't a choice, because what they did, the UKHCDO deliberately phased out the production of cryoprecipitate. And, as I said yesterday, that doesn't happen with anything else. If I went to my GP and she said, oh, Sue, we've got this really great anti-inflammatory that's just come on the market, I think it would be ideal for you, it's X, Y and Z and everything. If I decided to start taking it and it didn't agree with me, I would expect to go back and she'd say, well, never mind, we'll go back on whatever you're on now. But that didn't happen because they took away all choice. There was nothing left for them to, to go on to. And were, was Bob ever offered, or you ever offered, during the time that you're describing, any psychological support or <laughs> no. counselling of any kind? No. Um, we had a couple of people, Mary Fletcher and another lady called Mary from Oxford, who talked to us in Oxford and... They came up and talked to us in Birmingham, but they weren't proper counsellors. They were lovely, but they were just social workers. Just, I don't mean just, just social workers, you know what I mean. Um, then we pushed and pushed and pushed as a patient group to get somebody appointed at the Queen Elizabeth, and they eventually appointed Shirley Mallon as a social worker. And Shirley was magnificent. She was great. But, again, it wasn't counselling. No, I mean, the only time I've ever got close to having counselling was when um, three or four years ago the government allocated a pot of money to um, the Hep C Trust and you could apply and I thought about it for a couple of weeks and I thought well actually yeah for me and David so I applied and it's no easy thing to admit that you need help you know um, and they sent me the forms out and I filled them in and helped David fill his in. We got the forms sent off and after a bit I phoned them up and they said, oh, we've got no money left. Despite everything you've described about Bob's health, he carried on working as a DHSS mm. executive officer in, until about six months before he died. He was determined to work for as long as possible, yeah. He loved his job. But the point came when he, 
he could no longer work. Yeah. What can you tell us about the last weeks and days of Bob's life? Okay. Before I go on to that, I'll just say that I actually gave up work in the summer of that year because things were intolerable at home and at work. I had a new boss who, although he knew about Bob, had no empathy or understanding at all. I would tackle it differently now. I'd get in touch with the union, try and get compassionate leave or something, but he clearly thought I wasn't doing my job properly, which I probably wasn't at this stage. And he used to say, I need you here early in the morning. Now, bear in mind, I'd run the school as an acting head for two terms before he came, so I think I knew roughly what I was doing. But you need to be here earlier. You need to be here later. I'm sending you on management courses. And he sent me on management courses that involved me going away from home for only for days, but a long distance to travel back. And I remember one day breaking down on the M5 and just, and I don't do this, but just sitting sobbing on the hard shoulder. I just, it, it was awful. So yeah, I gave up work then. Um, Bob's last Christmas, 1990, 1991, was very difficult. I mean, we've got photographs of him sitting at um, neighbour's house and you look, at the time, you think it's normal in a way. You're kind of living with this day to day and you don't realise how bad it is. You look back at the photographs and think, my God, how could you not have realised how ill he was? But we were never told. We were never told he was terminal. Our GP was told. There's a letter in Bob, Bob's notes saying that it's palliative care only. We were never told. So I, we, we, I, I certainly wasn't expecting that, that, that he would die then. Um, he deteriorated very rapidly. It was a horrible, horrible winter. We had an awful lot of snow. It was very cold. We got a big house. I kept the heating on full, plus, you know, gas fires and stuff, but you could never get warm. He started to go kind of blue-tinged. You know, that's the only way I can explain it. You know, nails, lips and so on. And what we didn't realise that was it, his chest was so bad that he just wasn't able to... to getting the oxygen that his body needed. It wasn't just the cold, it was, it was a physical thing. Um, the reason we didn't realise it was that he'd had an X-ray at the QE, I think early January, which apparently showed shadowing on both lungs, and they did nothing. Uh, this is a man who's at very high risk for PCP pneumonia, and they did nothing. He may well have had antibiotics from our GP, I can't remember. Um, but certainly as far as the hospital goes, they'd obviously given up on him and decided he was going to die anyway. So um, they just uh, let him go home. And, and in contrast to that, a few years ago, I had a really bad chest infection, ended up coughing up blood and all sorts of nasty things. I had chest x-rays immediately. I had a CT scan. I had to have regular CT scans every six months for the next two or three years. And that is standard treatment. That's what is gold standard treatment, really. He, could, he, he wasn't even allowed that. You know, it was shadowing on both lungs. OK, go home and die, basically. Um, he did his last piece of television work. He used to enjoy doing the press work, but he really didn't want to do that final one because he was so poorly. But he got up and did it. Um, he was due to go into hospital on a... A Monday, um, because they were going to fit a nasogastric tube to try and give him some nutrition because he was so emaciated. I didn't know at the time that they'd also ordered a whole battery of other tests. I mean, why would you do that on someone who's clearly dying? You know, um, by the Sunday, the day before he was due to go in, he was so poorly. I mean, so desperately ill. I was just absolutely frantic I just didn't know which way to turn I made various calls to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and their attitude eventually was oh well all right if you insist bring him in then so my best friend and I managed to get him into the car uh, it didn't occur to me to ring an ambulance but I don't know <coughs> A&E wouldn't have been the best place anyway got him into the car took him to the back entrance at the QE I had to pester a porter for a wheelchair because he couldn't walk. We got him into the wheelchair, got him up onto the ward, and the doctor turned around to me and said, well, it doesn't look as bad as you made out. He was on the phone. Um, they then did a series of tests. They x-rayed his chest and did loads of bloods and everything, and all of a sudden there was all hell let loose. 
I got taken into a small room with three doctors, I think, and they were showing me the chest x-rays and clearly trying to tell me that Bob was dying and I just wasn't having any of it, you know, it just wasn't going in. And he said, but he's got no... Do you realise what we're trying to tell you? He has no, or relatively no, lo normal lung tissue left. It's all been destroyed. So by this time, Bob was on 100% oxygen and still blue. Um, he then started to hallucinate and get very, very agitated and confused. And apparently all his electrolytes were out of sync. I'm not quite sure how that works, but um, they changed his drip. I remember I went to shut the curtains in his room because it was late, late afternoon, early evening. He went mad. What are you doing? What are you doing? I said, well, it's going dark. Um, no, 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 it's daytime, it's daytime. And I remember <coughs> saying, but look, Coronation Street, or whatever it was, was on the television. And he wouldn't have it. He was so frightened because he thought it was daytime and we were shutting curtains and doing evening things, you know. Um, I have to apologise for the next bit because it may be all completely out of sync because the next two or three days just blurred into one. Um, he was put in charge of a junior... Dr Franklin was in Scotland on some sort of conference. He was put in charge, the charge of a junior doctor called Dr Russo. Um, she was very sweet. She was very Greek or Cypriot, and her, lang her English wasn't particularly good. But the main thing was she was exhausted. She sat there going, oh, I'm so tired, I'm so tired... And she said she'd done a 72-hour shift and she was now covering for someone else. And I didn't want to do this. And, oh, God, I don't know what I'm doing, you know. And I, now I would be jumping up and down, screaming for a decent consultant, any consultant, anyone that knew what they were doing. But in those days, we, we were all just being dragged along, you know. Anyway, um, one of the things that apparently was supposed to be done, had he been admitted normally, was... Um, arterial blood gases which basically means puncturing an artery and getting some blood out of it and finding out how much oxygen is in it the haemophilia sister was sent for to give him some factor 8 she was crying, sobbing she said please don't do this you can see what his blood gases are like he's blue even on oxygen no 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 I have to do this Dr Franklin's written it down I need to do this now again now I'd launched myself in between Bob and her and there would be no doubt that she wouldn't have got near him but I wasn't that person then you know so we stood back, both haemophilia sisters in floods of tears. They had to take the oxygen mask off Bob to find out what his normal oxygen levels would have been. So they let him... He was struggling for breath at that point. And she insisted on doing these blood gases. Um, they treated him for TB. They treated him with erythromycin, which we told them would give him diarrhoea. They gave him... Um, oh, I can't remember, some other antibiotic... But then they also decided that they would give him pentamidine, which is what, the sort of, sort of second-line treatment for PCP, because he was allergic to septrin, which at that time was the first-line one. Um, she, the, the doctor brought me the leaflet in the middle of the night, you know, the leaflets that go with the drugs, and she said, can you read this through and tell me what side effects I'm supposed to look for? I don't understand it. So I did. And it was basically, they had to be monitored, they had to lie flat, they had to have their blood pressure regularly checked because the main thing was a, a catastrophic drop in blood pressure. Um, that afternoon he had appalling diarrhoea. Luckily I had a friend with me who was a male nurse and we cleaned him up. There was not a nurse in sight, you know, we sorted all that out. Um, his mum came along and we gave him a bed bath. This is all quite biblical really, it's weird looking back on it, you know. And his sister came, and then we realised how poorly he was, so we started making phone calls. We got his son back from university in Brighton. Um, his oldest stepson came. David was poorly himself, and also only seven, and it was night time, and he was in bed, you know. Um, Bob had perked up a little bit. He'd actually had a little bit to eat, a bit of jelly or something like that, and he was able to swallow it, and he was quite lucid. And then all of a sudden, his blood pressure absolutely hit the floor. And there were doctors and nurses flying around all over the place. Oh, incidentally, one other thing was that I was convinced he was seriously dehydrated. 
because his drip ran out, the one with the pentamidine in, and I was interrupting handover meetings, attacking every nurse that I could find. Will you please come and put some more fluids up? No, 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 we'll do, we'll do them when we give him the next dose. And it is recorded in his notes, post-mortem, dehydrated. Um, and they wouldn't listen. And it was really at that time that he deteriorated very rapidly. Anyway, um, it's suddenly, at that point, occurred to me that actually this was really happening. He was dying. And I remember Paul, stand, my stepson, standing behind me with his arms around me, Bob in the bed. Bob's last words were, is everything sorted? And I know he meant financially, so I lied and said, yeah, it's all fine. And he then just crashed, and this young doctor, terrified, the look on his face, I'll never forget, hauled him up the bed. I've no idea why. Somebody said it might have been a technique to raise the blood pressure, but I would have thought he'd be better off lying down for that. I don't know why they did it. But his arms flopped out. It looked like he was being crucified, and actually that's exactly what was happening to him, if you think about it. Um, I don't remember getting home. I remember being taken to the room. I remember going back to see Bob in the, in, in, in the room that he was in, and they put this horrible... Hor Why do people do this? Why do we treat people with so little respect, this horrible, horrible quilt over him that, you know, my nan would have thrown out? And I think they thought they were doing something nice. But he's lying there dead with this hurried thing over him. So anyway, we went home. Don't know how I got home. No idea. Um, I remember it was full of people crying but trying not to because we didn't want to wake David up. I remember my sister grabbed a bottle of wine and hauled me off to bed with a couple of glasses and a bottle. Um, you know, it's whatever gets you through the night sometimes, I suppose. The next morning, we phoned the hospital to say, could we come and see him in the chapel of rest? And they said, no, because he's in a body bag and we will not open the body bag. So then the chairman of the local group of the Haemophilia Society got involved. And eventually, after a few phone calls, they agreed to open it, but only to chest level. So we all trooped along to the, well, it's a mortuary really, isn't it, at the hospital. And again, we were met by Carrie Howells, the haemophilia sister, who was in floods of tears again. And she said, Sue, I've tried, I've really tried. I can't shut his eyes. His eyes aren't shut. What did you say? We went in, and Bob was lying there from the chest up. I don't believe he'd been washed. I don't believe he'd been dressed. or I don't remember, really, what he was wearing. But I do remember that round his neck, they'd put this ghastly, horrible, cardboard rough, you know, like clowns wear. Why would you do that? I mean, you know, and his eyes were open, and in his right eye there was a little bit of cotton or fluff or something, and he got the same expression on his face that he had when he died the night before. Now, if you look back into ancient history, every culture respects the dead. Look at what the Egyptians did, burying them with artefacts and so on for the afterlife. <coughs> you know, very ancient people, prehistoric people, respected the dead. They looked after their dead. And we just didn't. Not, not, not with haemophiliacs, with AIDS we didn't. Bob died on the 20th of February 1991. Mm. And he was 47 years old. He was. And it was only... After his death, some time after his death, you learnt he'd also been infected with hepatitis C. You found a post-mortem reference to non-A, non-B. But you mm. haven't, I think, been able to find anything else in his records I about hepatitis C. No, we knew nothing. What was the effect of what you described on Bob's mum, who he and you were very close to? Mm. She was, she was an amazing, amazing woman. I mean, a, a week or so after he died, she gently suggested to me that I really needed to do something about the funeral. I mean, I was just walking around. I didn't, I didn't know whether it was day or night, you know, let alone organise funerals. Um, and she was always there for us. She was amazing. But she'd lost her only son. I mean, she'd fought for him since he was a tiny baby, you know. She'd fought to get him an education. She'd fought for treatment for him. She'd watched him through three, two marriages, not three. Um, 
And to lose him was devastating. And she never recovered. And two or three years later, I was at work and I got a call to say the fire brigade had had to break into her flat and they'd found her dead head first in the china cabinet with a brain hemorrhage. Bob's three sons, without going to in, into any detail about their, their lives, Bob's three sons, your, your own and, his, and your two stepsons, all struggled with the loss of their father. They did. All in different ways, but yeah. And Bob's eldest son, in his written evidence to the Archer Inquiry, he described Bob as, uh, my dad was the glue that held our family together. Yeah. I mean, I tried, but it's the difference between Gorilla Glue and wallpaper paste, you know. As you've described, you'd been a head deputy head teacher. Mm. You'd given that up to care for Bob. Yeah. How were you after Bob's death? I was a mess, absolute mess. Um, I did try and go back to some teaching. I mean, I, I loved my career, absolutely loved it. Even now, I would dream about children in a classroom two or three times a week. You know, all the things that I used to love doing with them. I, I think I was good at my job. Um, but... It, I could never get it back. And, yeah, as I said, I was a mess. I, I, I lost weight. So I, oh, I just... I couldn't cope with being a mother anymore. I couldn't cope with being a sort of homemaker anymore. It was just so difficult doing all that on my own. Um, some women have been a lot stronger than me. Some women have managed to hold it together. But it was just so, so... Hard. The things that I was proud of... I, I loved being a mum... I adored it when David came along. It was that unconditional love, you know, and still is. But I think, I think I'd found something I could do, something I was good at. My own family background is quite um, dysfunctional, I suppose, weird. Um, I never felt secure at home, but I did once I got my own home. But then it all just it fell apart. And, and your best friend has... Um provided her mm. her view in an email that uh, you're both happy for me to quote from. Yeah, it's only your very best friend that could write this. And she says this, in the early years, and you've been best friends for nearly 40 years. 40 years. In the early years, Sue had an extremely responsible job as a deputy head teacher and was an aspiring head teacher. She was also a wife to Bob and mother to David and two stepsons. As Bob became increasingly unwell, Sue found all her responsibilities overwhelming and was forced to resign from her deputy headship. Once it became impossible for Sue to care for Bob at home, he was hospitalised. Sue was at his side constantly. She lost all sense of day and night. A friend at myself would go to the hospital at perhaps midnight or 1am and insist she came home for some rest. During this time, David was looked after by Bob's mother, Hazel, and friends. Following Bob's death, Sue ceased to be the person I knew. She rapidly lost weight. She was constantly dashing in and out of the house, dealing with the galatis, being interviewed by the press, going to gigs until the early hours of the morning, something she'd never done before. When she was at home, it was a constant round of phone calls and a house full of reporters and cameramen. All David wanted was his mum, but she was reacting to Bob's death. It often fell to me to read him his bedtime story or bring him to our house to eat with our family. Uh, and... That's that's her perspective, mm, which I think is probably very fair. Provide it. You, you not been able to return to full time teaching. Your own health has suffered over the years, and you've attributed that, in part at least, to the stress of everything you've described. Possibly, I, th I think it could be. I mean, in the last ten years, I've had a hysterectomy, a hip replacement, a knee replacement, and breast cancer. In terms of your financial position, Bob had had to give up work, you had to give up work, so two solid incomes yeah. lost. How, after Bob's death, have you managed financially? I'm embarrassed by how bad it's been. I mean, really embarrassed. Um, it, it's... It's been really, really difficult. I mean, I've moved house. I've um, taken on various jobs. I have done teaching. I've done short-term contracts, but as you say, quite rightly, never full-time work again properly. Um, I've worked in care homes. I've helped run a sub-post office. 
I've done work in the Crown Post Office in, in, in our local town. I've taught foreign students English. I've done home tuition. Uh, I've done all sorts of stuff. I've been a ward clerk at two different hospitals. Um, but I've never, ever been able to make up that, that solid, regular income again. And I think this is what's lacking. And I think it's where the government is undeniably cruel um, in that they throw money at people and then go to the press bleating about how awful we are and, you know, how we sort of scrounge from them. And in the last few months, we've given them this and we've given them that and we've given them the other. Now, yes, £20,000, £10,000, fifty, or whatever it is, sounds an awful lot of money to the man in the street. But if you then look at it in terms of lost income, lost pensions and so on, and you get this, like, one-off payment, and what you do then is you replace everything that's broken and you try and save some to keep, keep you going for the future, and then it's gone again, and you've still got no regular money coming in. I'm going to ask you in a minute about your dealings with the McFarlane Trust, okay. but before we do that, you've given three examples in your witness statement of, of, of quite how awful things were in terms of your ability to, uh, to manage financially not having enough money to get the car put through an MOT so as to be able to continue to get to work, mm. going through your pockets, bags and drawers to find 50 pence to use for enough petrol to get home. That did happen one night, and, and various people since have said, why didn't you say? Because it's embarrassing, that's why. And small but important practical things like not being able to afford new glasses. Oh. My glasses are just an ongoing nightmare. Um, I've got very poor sight anyway, and I've got a really complicated prescription. And I think the McFarland Trust paid for a repair or a new set of glasses at one stage, but they wouldn't help again. And I broke my glasses, and for two years I was going around with an old prescription, which was giving me ocular migraines, which are horrible. It's like you're having a stroke. It's awful. Everything's like a kaleidoscope, you know. Um, and I couldn't see, and I've got continual headaches and so on, until I could afford some, some new glasses. They flatly refused to pay for them. I think you'll demonstrate why in a bit, or their reasoning why. Um, and I have to say, the EIBSS have been exactly the same, if not worse. Um, since I had breast cancer last year, the um, radiotherapy has caused very dry eyes, and it's also exacerbated cataracts in both eyes. I've had three lots of glasses in the last 18 months. I'm as blind as a bat at the moment and I can't afford another pair. And they flatly refuse to pay. In general terms, before we look at some specific correspondence, in general terms, what were your experiences of dealing with the McFarlane Trust? Right at the beginning, they were OK. I mean, there were people like Anne Hiddersay, who was very kind. She was lovely. She used to phone us up at home and she'd say, are you OK? What's going on? Is there anything you need? Anything we can help you with? And that continued for some time after Bob died. But then I, I, I think they, they were beginning to realise that as people were dying, they weren't actually getting rid of the problem. They were, they were, they were inheriting a new one in terms of widows and, and children. Um, and they started to tighten up um, and become very difficult. Um, I always had a policy that if I did need some help, I, I would approach them because, after all, that's what they were set up to do. And I just tried to, I don't know, encourage them to do their job, really. Mm. Um, and I would also advocate on behalf of other people, and in particular David, I, I, I would always um, try and get him help. Um, I was told by um, a trustee a few years ago that because it, all these... Um, requests would have to go in front of a committee. Um, I was told by a trustee that the minute they know you're involved, they turn it down on principle. You were also, I think, told that, um, that McFarland Trust had given you more than any other widow, but you were then learnt that other widows had been told the yeah, same thing. Yeah, Claire Walton looked at me and laughed and said, oh, you as well, they told me that too. You had a loan from the McFarland Trust yeah. secured on your house... Yeah, I, I applied for a grant and they flatly refused and this was a point when I was paying the mortgage on credit cards and buying food on credit cards and you get pushed into this corner and you have no choice. They offered it as a loan and I took it. 
and they then said, well, we'd like £300-odd pounds a month in repayments. Now, if I'd have had £300-odd pounds a month spare, I wouldn't have been asking them for you know, a loan or any assistance. Um, so we settled eventually on £25 a month, which came out of the top-up payment that I was getting at the time, and that was um, deducted at source. So they, you go to them or you went to them, and I see no difference now, um, in financial distress, you're already in debt, and all they do is give you another debt. And not only that, they've then got a share of your house as well. And you've expressed your view in your witness statement um, of what you describe as a fundamental problem of no money ever being paid to widows in their own right. Mm. I've never recognised the widow's losses. I mean, to be fair, they haven't recognised anybody's losses particularly well because they've never done a proper assessment of impact or loss. So what they did was to pluck this sum of money out of the air and there was a pot. And they said, well, we'll distribute it between you different groups that we have created. And, oh, goody, that will set you off one against the other. And you can spend the next couple of years arguing about who's getting what. And that lets us off the hook for a bit. I'm, I'm certain that is their logic. A number of years after Bob's death, you began a relationship with a new partner. Mm. How did that affect the McFarlane Trust's dealings with you? Well, basically, they're, they're, they, they suddenly decided they'd come up with a policy until I asked to actually see the policy when they started referring to it, I think, as an unwritten policy. Um, that they do not give grants to women who have moved on, for example, finding a new partner. Now, my argument there is it's threefold, really. First of all, the only reason we found a new partner was because the old one had been murdered by the treatment. And I don't use the word murdered lightly. The second thing is it makes two assumptions. First of all, that any new man in your life is perfectly happy to take on full res uh, financial responsibility for you and is able to do so. And the second assumption is that the, the widow, or the woman, is equally happy for this man to waltz into her life and say, well, don't worry, dear, you just sit at home and knit or something and, and I'll de deal with all the finances. You know, this is not the 1800s. I had a really good income. I'm not even talking about Bob's income. I'm talking about my income, which was lost, my pension, which was lost. It should be a really substantial pension, and it's about 8000 a year. And you had a letter after you moved to Devon from um, the McFarlane Trust, um, which started, you described in your witness statement, in, with these words, when you moved to Devon with your new partner leaving your son behind in Birmingham. Yeah, I will never, ever forgive for saying that, ever. And I'm a very forgiving person, but no. Well, just look at the letters that, or emails that deal with the, the, the policy that mm. you've described. Paul, could we have up on screen, please, 1564004? We can see it's a letter dated the 8th of December 2006. Um, it refers to a clothing grant being agreed for David, but then says that the NSSC have declined additional financial assistance <coughs> to you for the following reasons. Three reasons given, and then the fourth is this. Although there is no firm policy... The trust takes the view that after 10 years following bereavement and where a non-infected widow has the good fortune to establish another relationship, that individuals should be afforded every opportunity to move forward in the context of that relationship mm. and enable the trust to provide support to others in less fortunate yeah, circumstances. Yeah, how very generous of them. Your response, Sue, we can see at 15640005... We go down first of all to the bottom of the page, please, Paul. This is your email of the 12th of December 2006. Um, uh, and if we go on to the, the next page, please, Paul, uh, we can just pick it up um, where it says, Good fortune to establish another relationship. You say this, Sue. Good fortune to establish another relationship. Words fail me. Why do you think I did this? It was not easy, believe me. If Bob had not died, I wouldn't have had to. My partner, as you well know, is not able to contribute financially. If he was, I certainly wouldn't be begging for money. 
It is impossible to move forward, as you put it, when I am facing financial ruin. And then we see the response. If you go back to the first place, page, please, Paul. We see the response in an email of the 20th of December 2006. The penultimate bullet point says this. The 10-year cut-off plan is not formulaic. It is an approximate time frame that the trust applies to those who have been bereaved but have managed to gain some sort of independence, i.e. embarking on a new relationship being just one component of that phase. The issue then came up... And then they wish me yes. a Merry Christmas at yes. the end. Yeah. So, I should say, in the context of you having said in your email, I should like to ask that you reconsider your decision and ask that you afford me a grant at least to get through Christmas. Mm. Um, Paul, could we have up on screen next 1564006, please? This is the 16th of June 2008. Dear Sue, the NSSC met on the 12th of June 2008 and considered your request for financial assistance towards your glasses. Unfortunately, they have declined a grant for this purpose as the Trust does not give grants to widows who have either remarried or are in a new relationship. I would like to draw your attention to my earlier sentence about a new relationship. The Trust has to make difficult choices and one of our concerns are those widows who do not have, as the trust would see it, the advantage, which I appreciate is not necessarily financial, of the support that comes from being in that position. I am well aware that this may not be acceptable to you, but it is a policy of the trust. Mm. You've not, I think, ever seen a written policy no, to that I, effect. No, I, I did keep asking for it, but no, never. But then they used to change the trustees with such alarming regularity without actually consulting with anybody about it. Who knows? And then, for the sake of completeness, there's one further communication that deals with this particular issue, 1564007. And it's the 3rd of July, 2008, so you've obviously, I think, gone back again and just, please, could you have the money for some glasses? <laughs> the NSCC met yesterday and considered your appeal for financial assistance towards your glasses, but unfortunately they've upheld their original decision. Uh, and then it refers to the a query you've raised about support to those in new relationships. and says this, they ask, we've relayed the following to you, that it's long been known that widows who have remarried or are in a new relationship are no longer eligible for financial assistance from the trust unless they have children by the primary beneficiary who are still dependents of the trust. However, in exceptional circumstances, the trustees may agree financial assistance at their discretion it has become clear that some widows in new relationships wish to disengage themselves from the trust, and we take the view that respect for a widow's privacy is paramount. Well, the last bit's irrelevant. Um, you know, other widows may well wish to disengage from the trust. I, I chose not to. Um, I don't know. As I just said to Andy, it's a gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? We can take that down, please, Paul, and put the photo back. Mr Richards, you? just before you, yes. you move on, um, those, those letters uh, appear to um, penalise uh, Sue for her marital status. Uh, it occurs to me that certainly by the time of the Equality Act in 2010, uh, discrimination on marital status was unlawful. Yes, not in fact, in, indeed, in marital status, um, I think, but, but any kind of further relationship. Well, yes. e effectively, at the same point. Um, perhaps um, some inquiries can be made as to what the legal position was actually in 2008. Certainly, sir. So in your capacity as a member of the Tainted Blood Committee, you saw a number of emails from the McFarlane Trust did, yes. a, a few years ago. But you've drawn a, 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 the inquiry's attention to three that you recall. You don't yourself have copies. Mm. Um, um, three examples. I wonder if you could tell us what those are. Yeah, we were um, given the emails by Gareth as chair. Um, he sent them round to a few of us. Um, I don't know how they were, were obtained, but they've stuck in my memory. Um, after a time, I know that Martin Harvey and I believe his wife travelled down to South Wales to give a formal apology to Hayden. Because um, if I remember right, the gamer didn't actually want to let them in. Um, and after the apology, Gareth asked that we should all delete these emails from our hard drives. 
which we did. And I was quite surprised when I went searching for them a few weeks ago that I really did delete them and they weren't on any other hard drive. Um, but there were three, there are three examples. Um, the first one refers to Gareth and Hayden and those of us that knew them well love them to bits. They were like chalk and cheese, but they were fantastic men, fantastic advocates for the campaign. Um, and, you know, we miss them daily. And they were referred to in an email, an MFT email, as the Welsh terrorists. The second one somebody's marriage had broken up. We, we've had a lot lot of relationship and marriage breakups in our community and it's quite obvious why, you know, the strains and the stresses and so on. When someone finds a new partner, I, I think it should be a, a cause for rejoicing. You know, it should be something good that's come out of it. One gentleman had done that after his marriage broke up and the name of the new partner cropped up and somebody said, oh, who is so-and-so? And the reply in an email was, oh, that is X's latest squeeze. And the final one, and I think most people in this room have heard this bounced around, but I've actually seen it in the email. Um, we, as a community, that means people who've sat here, talked to you, me, Andy, <coughs> Jan, Colin, all these people, Aid, Mark, are referred to as the great unwashed. We touched in your answers a few um, moments ago on your view that under the McFarlane Trust's replacement, the EIBSS, mm. things haven't greatly changed from, or improved from your perspective. No. You've given um, some examples in your witness statement of of particular issues that you have had with EIBSS. You can't get your travel costs in relation to the, the, the travel you've had to undertake for radiotherapy for your yeah, cancer. Yeah, it was um, 120 mile round trip to Exeter every day, five days a week for three weeks. And I approached them to see if they could help with travel costs. And they said, no, we don't give grants to widows, travel expenses grants. The assistance of a benefits advisor who had been funded by the McFarlane mm. Trust and who had provided practical support and assistance <coughs> to your son, yeah. that, that won't, isn't funded under the EIBSS. No, they wouldn't continue it. I mean, the work was continuing, so I've had to fund it. And in fact, it got so bad that he agreed that I could pay him so much a month and I've still got one payment left. You've said that as... As widows, you're entitled to little more than a funeral grant and retraining for a new career. Mm. A joke when most of us are in our 50s and 60s, you say. Yeah. And you've referred to the discrepancy in your witness statement between the position of widows outside of Scotland and those within Scotland. Yeah, I think it's a disgrace. I mean, I make no judgment on the amounts of money that have been awarded to groups. Um, that is not my responsibility. But what I would say is, if something has happened to you under the same circumstances, then you should be afforded equal and fair treatment. And for a widow in my position in Scotland to, to receive 27750 a year and for me to receive nothing, when both our husbands were infected and died under the same Westminster government, is abhorrent. It, it, it is just grossly unfair. It's... I don't know what it is with the widows with Westminster. They have clearly been trying now for some years to get rid of us. Um, there was a, a review, one of many reviews, uh, two or three years ago, and one of the options they looked at was to taper off support to widows with a view to exiting them from the scheme. And I believe that's more or less what they've done. And you've described... Um, in the statement um, that EIBSS has been nicknamed the Last Chance Saloon. Yeah, one of many. But, um, yeah. As people have to first prove they've tried every other avenue for support, if necessary, provide several quotes and even then get turned down. Yeah, I mean, do they know how hard it is for some of these people who are so poorly to have to approach, I don't know who they approach, the social fund or whatever, you know, to try and get money for whatever it is. And then you've got these other ridiculous anomalies. They don't give money for white goods. Why not? What is likely to go wrong in your life? The washing machine will break down or the fridge freezer or something. 
Um, I, I know a haemophiliac who went without a fridge in his home for about three years. Do you know anybody without a fridge? And they wouldn't pay for it because it counts as white goods. And I've never been able to get any rationale behind that either. You've spent many years since Bob's death campaigning uh, involved with Tainted Blood. Mm. Uh, you've described it as an unpaid full-time job. Um, yeah, I think it is. Not just for me, but for, for a whole group of us, yeah. And that's involved your meeting, your, your statement describes attending meetings, demonstrations, giving interviews, asking questions, continuing to ask questions mm. when dissatisfied with the answers you've been given, providing support to others. Mm. You gave evidence to the Archer inquiry. Can you give us a sense of of what it's been like over the years for you, this this dominant factor in your life in terms of the campaigning that you've done? Yeah, I mean, I've written down here that, that, that for 30 years I've kept us, uh, deliberately, I think, dancing on the en en end of strings. You know, we make ribbons, we make bracelets, we commission T-shirts and, you know, ties, and we turn up suited and booted and trying to look respectable and, and we, we write letters and we go to Parliament... You know, I must be one of the few people in the country, that, well, apart from people here, that can walk into Westminster Hall and think, yeah, again. You should be walking into Westminster Hall thinking, wow. But we are, you know, we've done it so many times and we go over the same thing. We've had politicians crying in the House. You know, please sort this out. I entirely blame what's going on behind the scenes in the civil service. There is some... I, I don't know what it is. But, yeah, I mean, every now and again, we manage to put the government in a, in a little bit of a corner um, because we come up with some sort of evidence that they can't argue about. And so they say, oh, OK, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have a review and we'll get you to fill in some forms. Um, yes, we know you're filling in information which we already hold, but we, we need you, and, and we need to find out what like everybody in your household is earning, and we need to find out what your problems are, what you'd like, and here's our three preferred options, and you can't go behind that, beyond that. Um, and I think the campaigning itself, as, and, and everything else that's gone with it, even for those who don't actively campaign, has been as big a scandal and as big a tragedy as what happened in the first place because it's taken people's lives. I mean, look at us today, again. And we always turn up, don't we? I mean, we're always here. You, in your evidence to Lord Archer, said this... We will only be able to move on and truly live our lives when we know the truth has come out and everything possible has been done to address this catastrophe. Does that remain your view yeah. years later? Yeah, it does. See, so those are the questions I have mm. for you. I know you have some more you want to say and there are some photos mm. and some video footage we're going to show. Before we do that, let me just ask Mr Snowden if there's anything further. Just, just one thing, um, I, and it's the perspective of, of your stepson, Paul, mm. um, in his evidence to the Archer Inquiry, just one small passage um, that Mr Snowden asks me to draw attention to. I never saw my dad as outside people did. Although disabled by haemophilia, he was a very active and involving person. He loved life and tried to make the most of what he had. He taught me DIY, chess, table tennis, badminton, and too many other things to mention here. He tried to teach me to fish and failed, much to his disappointment. Mm. But most of all, he was my dad. Yeah, thank you. So there are, I think, you have some closing observations. I do, but there's one other thing, yes. if, if I may, yes, just of before course. I, do, I do that. Um, David Cameron's apology. Yep. We're fed up with hearing people say, say how sorry they are. To me, an apology only means something if two things are in place. One is a full understanding of what you're apologising for, and I don't believe he got a clue. And the second thing is a willingness to actually act and put right what you can. And that wasn't in place either. And after that apology, we've had a flurry of people telling us how sorry they are, and it, it goes right over our heads. So, yes. That. You've got some observations yes. you want to make. After that, there are some photographs um, that you want to show. Yeah. 
And then after that, there is a video of Bob so that we end your evidence with Bob. Yeah. If anyone had told me in 1985 that I would still be campaigning in 2019, more than 34 years later, I'd probably have said they were stark raving mad. That I am still campaigning demonstrates to me that there is something fundamentally wrong in this country. Time after time after time, we have seen victims having to fight for many years in order to achieve justice. Most recently, the Hillsborough families, whose campaign, like ours, went on for decades. There has to be a better way. One clear reason for this is that people are having to do battle directly with the perpetrators. In the case of Hillsborough, it was the football club and the police, whereas with us, our campaign has been aimed at the very heart of government, as well as prominent members of the medical and scientific community and the giant, all-powerful pharmaceutical companies. All of them have held more power and financial clout than we could ever muster, and they know it. On most occasions, we've had to finance our campaigning ourselves, although one notable exception to this, the Judicial Review in 2010, proved to us that with properly financed, sorry, financed legal rep representation, we could win through. Our ongoing battles have been compounded by the fact that financial support for victims has been set up by the very government department at the heart of the scandal in the first place. Hence, it has never been compensation, despite the word still being in regular use by some members of the press. Instead, it has been ex gratia, meaning no liability support. And therein lies the true shame of successive governments who have used this very support system to divide and rule its victims. Many years ago in Ireland, a system of no-fault compensation on compassionate grounds was instituted, so, if, so it can be done if the will is there. Clearly, in Westminster, it is not. Following on from that, I would like to commend the campaigners for their tenacity and their courage in the face of such abject cruelty from those whose actions and inactions caused this and who should have helped and supported us. Many of those I knew at the beginning are no longer with us, and I'm sure that suits the government perfectly, for when one day, hopefully not too far away now, they are forced to provide proper compensation their bill will be very much smaller than it would have been had they done the right thing at the start. Not, of course, that they'll shed any tears over this. Or, as Mr Kenneth Clark said in January 1985, when he was Minister of State for Health, as only haemophiliacs have died, only haemophiliacs, I am completely convinced that from the outset haemophiliacs were viewed as expendable. Not by all the doctors, as we have heard, many of them were excellent, and certainly not by most of the nurses. But the UKHCDO, the unknown, as yet, civil servants, the pharmaceutical companies and members of the British government, some still serving, truly have blood on their hands. Haemophiliacs in the early days were a compliant, finite, trusting group that was well used to hospitals, blood tests and so on. They readily cooperated with their doctors, believing them to be acting in their best interests. I make no apology for saying that the majority of our community are not like that now. There were so many warnings in the early days, including two from the World Health Organisation, we should and could have achieved self-sufficiency in our blood supply and raised donation standards before any damage was done. But then, as now, the health and safety of our population proved to be a very low priority in terms of government spending and attention to detail. I've always maintained that this is not about affordability. The money was there for self-sufficiency and it is there for compensation today. What is lacking is what Hayden Lewis used to call political will. We have simply never been important enough. We are still not important enough. We are not a priority. Or, in the now familiar words of Edwina Curry, your haemophilia patient might die three weeks later and, hey, presto, you've got a very wealthy family. They haven't got haemophilia, they haven't got AIDS, but they've got a million quid of public money. 
there was a time lag of around three years between HIV infection in haemophiliacs in the US and those in the UK. Three years. What would the average person in the street have used those three years for, I wonder? I suspect that the vast majority would have put urgent measures in place to protect haemophiliacs from over, over here from suffering the same fate as those in America. After all, we knew perfectly well decades before this time that blood can carry viruses, particularly hepatitis, and we knew that we were importing vast amounts of American plasma products. It really shouldn't have been that hard, should it? They had three years in which I believe most of the infections to haemophiliacs could have been avoided three years. Instead, they did the opposite. Effectively, they sat back and monitored the spread of AIDS into the UK. I'd like to make one other thing clear. I said in my evidence to the Archer Inquiry that this scandal was wholly avoidable, and I stand by that. A child could have made better decisions over haemophilia care. Many times over the years, I've heard campaigners saying that there have been breaches of the Human Rights Act and the Nuremberg Code. Following much research, I have to say I agree, but then I'm not an expert. I do hope, though, that the inquiry team will look at these claims and make some kind of judgment on them. If our assertions are incorrect, then so be it. But please tell us why. If we were right all along, then of course we would expect the perpetrators to be identified and to face appropriate action. I want to say a few words about HIV infection. We've all heard the utterly devastating testimonies of those who were infected with hepatitis C. The virus and its treatments are undeniably horrendous. It is a slow, creeping, insidious taker of lives and it is taking more and more. It should be remembered that haemophiliacs have been exposed to multiple viruses, prions and other contaminants through their treatment. But for those with HIV, there is a greater burden than is often acknowledged. There are, very few, there are very few survivors today from the co-infected group. Less than a quarter remain with us. And the way they have been treated by the Department of Health and the support schemes has been utterly dis despicable. I am absolutely certain that in the early days when there was no treatment whatsoever and when life expectancy was so low that the government believed that this particular problem would soon be out of the way. Fast forward three decades and the treatment of the co-infected has been appalling throughout. The extra impact of the two viruses has never been openly acknowledged by government, despite the fact that studies commissioned by them have proved it conclusively. The fact that this small group has acted as guinea pigs for every HIV medication as it comes on the market has been ignored. I'm sick to death of people telling me it's OK now as AIDS is treatable, just like diabetes in fact. No, it certainly is not. Those who are still alive contracted the virus around 30 years ago, and by the time any treatments came along, their immune systems were shot to ribbons. They all face daily a nasty drug routine, which, if they are lucky, keeps the virus at bay. If the drugs stop working or they stop taking their meds, they will die. The first drug that came along, AZT, was initially prescribed in such high doses that the majority of people who took it did not survive. Haemophiliacs, along with other early victims, have been guinea pigs or pioneers for every treatment for HIV as it came on the market. Because of them, and in particular the small group alive today, we are now able to treat HIV, provided it is detected early. This country, and indeed the world, owes these people a huge debt of gratitude. It's often been said that the government is stringing this out until we're all dead, and I believe that could well be the case. Over the years, I've often said confidently to the press and to politicians that even if, when this happens, the campaign will continue, thanks to the children of victims who will carry on our fight. I have to be honest and say that often, as I said that, I was thinking, will they really? Or will we, be, we all be forgotten when the last one dies? I'm so glad to be able to say that I was right. Over the last few years, the grown-up children have risen like a flock of phoenixes, and they're awesome. They're built on what we've tried to do, and their sheer energy and determination is quite formidable. I would like to take this opportunity to thank them all for their courage. Thanks must go to, to Sir Brian and the inquiry team, including the technical squad, 
and to Colin's solicitors, all of whom have been incredibly supportive throughout and have granted me the privilege of giving evidence today. I'm sure we haven't been the easiest people to deal with on occasion. Indeed, we've probably driven you mad at times. But hopefully you'll realise why we're like we are. It's truly not personal, I promise. To be frank, it's all been a bit bewildering, as we're really not used to the sort of treatment you've given us. I looked around this room earlier in the year and thought, all this, for us. So thank you for treating us with kindness and dignity. To the victims who have given testimony, we applaud you for your bravery in telling your story. To the haemophilia community, you are astonishing. You are kind, protective of each other, generous, supportive, and the most bloody-minded, determined group of people I know. I'm certain that if Gareth had survived, and we miss him terribly, he would have been so proud of what TB has become. He'd never actually have told you that, of course, but I know he'd have felt it. I recently read an old Mexican proverb that I think sums up the campaigners nicely. They tried to bury us. They didn't know that we were seeds. My final message is to the people that caused this in the first place. It's to the politicians who have lied, including on several occasions misleading the House. To the doctors who didn't see children, babies and mild haemophiliacs, but simply guinea pigs ripe for experiment. To the pharmaceutical companies and the scientists whose greed and tunnel vision rode, rode roughshod over one of society's most vulnerable groups. And to all of you I say this. You've taken away so much from so many people. Your actions have taken people's health, their financial independence, their dignity, often their homes, their families, marriages and their friendships, and in thousands of cases, life itself, leaving behind bereaved families, orphaned children, and a grief that for many is still as raw as the day their loved one died. You've reduced many of us to rock bottom, but you know what? You can't take the most important things, the things that you yourself have lacked, humanity, and the love that binds us together. I am extraordinarily proud of what I see every day on the TB Facebook group. If someone is down, there is a flurry of messages to support them. If someone has a problem and needs advice, that advice comes in shed loads. If someone is dying or sick, I see a gentleness and a reaching out to do what we can to help. When someone dies, virtual arms are wrapped around the family and someone is always there for them. This amazing support and compassion goes on pretty well 24 hours a day. I know a lot of nocturnal people. We know that we are just very little fish in a very big pond and that because of your money and your power, you have always had the upper hand. But we have one overriding quality that gives me some hope and that is the truth. We have only ever told it as it is and it is the truth that has been heard so far by this inquiry. I, and imagine, I imagine hundreds of others excuse me, are sick and tired of your platitudes and your tree-hugging simpering. We don't want to hear that you deeply regret or that you are sorry, nor do we want to hear that it should never have happened. Of course it should never have happened. <coughs> that much was understood by us decades ago, and surely to goodness isn't rocket science. No, we only want to hear one thing from you, and that's the truth. We want to know why human life was downgraded ahead of scientific research and making money, and why the victims you created have since been treated as second-class citizens. If you have to be dragged kicking and screaming to this inquiry, then so be it. Please don't think that sudden memory loss, old age or ill health will be an acceptable excuse not to turn up or to give inadequate evidence. You won't fool us, and I'm pretty sure you won't fool the inquiry team either. My hope, then, is that this inquiry will give us closure. But if it all goes pear-shaped, then all I can say is that history will be your judge. And for that, I'm very glad. Final thanks must go to Andy Evans for sitting with me today and also the many other campaigners for their amazing support. A special mention must be given to my incredible and talented friend Richard Warwick, without whom the next bit would not be possible. I want to finish with a very short list of names. I must stress that they are no more or less important than anyone else who has died because we've all known huge losses. However, as people who have been associated closely with tainted blood and in, who in some cases campaigned for decades, literally up until they died, 
they represent other campaigners UK-wide who have quietly and privately suffered the same fate due to the wicked intransigence and abject cruelty of government. Their efforts have been no less valued. Having said that, of course, the first name is that of someone who never campaigned in his short lifetime, but who has become the one who gets us through the night and whose image makes us pull ourselves together when we feel like giving up. So, on behalf of everyone in Tainted Blood, please join me to remember the following with thanks and gratitude for what they did and what we have tried to continue doing in their memory. Paul, could you play the slideshow, please? You can have my toys when I'm gone. Colin Smith died 1990, age seven. You don't know what's in it. Bob Threckle died 1991, age 47. We've been given a life sentence without parole while those who are responsible have continued their high-flying careers. Gary Kelly died 2008. What they're hoping for is that we'll all get picked off one by one and eventually there will be no one left to answer to. Charles Loder died 2009, age 43. It is not an act of parliament that is needed, but an act of political will. Hayden Lewis died 2010, age 53. Life's a bitch and then you die. Gareth Lewis died 2010, age 52. You can't get worse off than dead. Mike Doricott died 2015 age 47. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. All those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Time to die. From the bedroom wall of Darren Flack, died 2016, age 47. They really have treated so many with, so, with little concern or respect. It seems to me they make up the rules as they go along. Paul Hooper died 2017, age 53. I'd like them to never enjoy a night's sleep ever again for what they did. Steve Diamond died 2018, age 62. Thank you. And we're going to end with Bob himself. Yeah. Could you play the video, please, Paul? They gave me something which I thought would cure haemophilia, and it did. But unfortunately, it also introduced HIV. And my initial reactions were, good God, they've killed me. But Bob and his wife Sue aren't amongst the 600 infected haemophiliacs suing the government and local health authorities for not screening factor aid. Because they both work, they earn too much to qualify for legal aid. If we want to sue for compensation, we have to fund that ourselves. Now, we're not talking 10 or 50 pounds, we're talking over two or 3,000 pounds here. And it could well be more if it goes into a protracted court case, which there's every indication it will. And we just can't afford that. I would personally like to see it so I could actually sue for compensation. I'm not asking for a guarantee that we would win. I would just like the right, the privilege, if you like, to actually fight the case in the first place and, and prove that we're right, that you know it is their fault and therefore they should pay. You can't plan the way I used to plan for a future. You, you can't rely on things like insurance to provide for children because they just can't get insurance. Um, that sort of thing's all gone. Uh, it's just a daily basis now that I live. Um, there is no future. In 85, I was called into the hospital and told that a test had shown that I was positive HIV, AIDS, as I think they called it then. Um, 
And that was it, basically. There wasn't much else they could tell me at the time. And, and initially, it didn't really mean an awful lot. It was only later when we began to find out exactly what HIV AIDS was, the implications of it. The fact that it had, in effect, shortened my life from normal to maybe five or six years at the most. You know, that was absolutely devastating. Absolutely devastating. Whose product were you taking? Whose Factor 8 was it? My records show that I was given Armour Factor 8. These are Bob's medical records, with the date of every treatment and the batch numbers which show the Factor 8 that gave him AIDS was made by Armour. These people had a choice. I wasn't given a choice. I wasn't told what the choice was. You know, you can take Factor 8, but it may lead to... Or you can go back to the old system and have your bed rest, which was painful, but it didn't give me HIV. If we were to tell you that the company and others knew there was a problem, a serious problem, and had connived together, I think that's the right word, mm. to institute delaying tactics till they got their house in order, how would you feel about that? I'd be absolutely appalled because, I mean, what they've done now is sentence people like me to death. By, by delaying whatever they delayed, tests or whatever it was. But, you know, I, I'd be outraged. It's absolutely incredible. You know, they've obviously taken many, many thousands of people's lives in their hands purely for financial gain. You know, I think it's totally immoral. We showed Bob the documents which proved that the blood companies led by Armour had indeed used delaying tactics to avoid testing and to carry on selling. Well, words fail me. It's absolutely sh diabolical that they put presumably profit before my life. Yeah, they were sitting around the table quibbling about money while we were injecting Bob with live AIDS virus. Yeah, which they knew about. And which they provided. That's... Yeah, it's inhuman. It's absolutely appalling that they should even contemplate doing something like that. It really is. And do they know what they've done? How long do you think you have left to live? That's the hardest thing to kind of cope with, actually, because I'm not sure how long I've got. I, I've lost nearly two stone in weight over the past 12 months. And should that continue, then obviously I've only got perhaps another year or so to go. Um, hard to speculate. A year, two years. Who do you blame for all this? I've got to blame the government. It's got to be their fault. There can no, be nobody else that I can blame. They were the ones that, through the health service, gave me this factor eight which would purported to do me good. And in fact, he's done me nothing but harm at the end of the day. Mr. Budgeon, didn't the haemophiliacs have the right to expect that blood that was given out by the Department of Health was clean, that it had been tested? Well, I don't know about the right, though. Of course, they hoped that it was uh, uh, clean. <laughs> uh, and, indeed, and indeed, the government hoped that it was clean. What, what has to be proved is that the National Health Service was negligent. In the suburbs of Birmingham, nobody in the Threckall household ever dreamt they could be affected by AIDS. But Bob Threckall was a haemophiliac. Until they found out that Bob had become HIV positive, the Threckalls regarded themselves as a perfectly ordinary family. They had learned to cope with Bob's haemophilia, but now they faced another and more terrible misfortune. I suppose it hasn't all been bad luck, really. I mean, it was something which should never have happened. I actually first met Bob when I, I had a holiday job at his office and uh, I didn't know him very well at all. I just used to see him in the canteen and thought he was quite nice, you know, quite pleasant. Um, but it was some years before we really got to know each other when my sister actually started going out, out with his best friend and we started going out as a foursome. And uh, then he became best man at my sister's wedding. I was chief bridesmaid and then the inevitable happened, you know, just like the stories and... Uh, we got married and decided we wanted to start a family fairly soon and had our little boy a couple of years after we got married. 83 was the date I was actually diagnosed HIV positive uh, in, in the sense that that's when I contacted it. But I wasn't told till 85 when I had a blood test which the hospital confirmed was HIV. Um, at that time, they, they couldn't really explain what would happen. Uh, the papers picked it up very quickly and they were talking dramatically in terms of two years to five years life and that was it. You know, you die from 
fungal pneumonia or, or whatever. We knew he'd had a blood test at his normal clinic appointment a few weeks beforehand and that he was going on, on this particular morning for the result. And he actually came and picked me up at work for lunch. And I remember we were sitting on the car park actually when he told me. And um, he actually said, oh yes, it, the test was positive. They don't really know what it means. They think that a very few people will go down with this disease called AIDS, but that I'll probably be all right. But they said that we're to take, use, use protected sex and we're not to have a baby for two years. And that was the whole extent of the advice we were offered at the time. It wouldn't happen with any other disease. You know, if, if you get cancer or MS or something like that, people have every sympathy and, you know, they're, they're all rallying around and fundraising and all the rest of it. But because it, it's got sexual connotations, you know, people... Their, their, their attitudes change. I mean, if, if it's something like gonorrhea or syphilis, I suppose you can go up to the special clinic and get sorted out, and no one need ever know. But, um, you know, with this, there comes a point when you can't hide it away any longer, although people try to. We know of people who are absolutely terrified that people will find out. You know, people who... Men who, who are one of, say, five or six brothers, and they're all haemophiliacs, and they don't know who's positive and who's negative. They won't even talk to their brothers and sisters about it. They won't tell their parents. They don't want their neighbours to know. And it just wouldn't, it just simply would not happen with any other disease, any other illness. The last three months, four months, I haven't been able to go to work. A lot of it lately is to do with the cold. That's basically because of weight loss. I'm very glad that Sue's here because there isn't a lot I can actually do without sort of making myself breathless and that sort of thing. I occupy myself by doing jigsaws and reading and watching the television and listening to the cassettes and many things like that. But you haven't got the satisfaction of actually going to work. Bob Threckle was admitted to hospital on the 17th of February this year. He died three days later. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Sue, um, thank you very much uh, as perhaps befits a former teacher. Uh, you've used your words to paint very vivid pictures. First, the first part of what you were saying, the picture of the human being that Bob was. And in the second part, uh, how you described your struggles that came in the aftermath of what we've just seen was his death in 91. But thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We'll take a break until 20 to 3. Thank you, sir. 20 to 3.